Well, hello everyone and welcome to the second lecture of the course. I have titled this second lecture DAGs, Deseparation and Data Translating Between the Language of Causation and Probability Theory. Now a DAG or a Directed Acyclic Graph is an object in the mathematical area of graph theory. Deseparation is a mathematical operation that you perform on these directed acyclic graphs that allow you, as you'll see, to predict how physical control translates into statistical control. And data, of course, are the actual things that we observe in science. So it's extremely rare that we can actually observe our data being generated and where one variable causes another, which causes another, and so on. Usually this causal process is hidden from us and what we actually observe are the results of this causal process in the form of data, things that we observe in nature. The idea of translating between languages refers to the idea that we are actually using different languages when we talk about causation and causal hypotheses in science and dependence and independence when we're looking at statistics and probability theory. So these are two different languages that contain different concepts and these concepts are not directly translatable one to the other. An alternative title I could give for this second lecture is how to replace the notion of physically controlling a variable in a causal system with the notion of a statistical control in a causal system. So in our first lecture we studied the logic behind the controlled experiment and if you remember the logic was to first predict how the variables link together in a causal sequence which variable causes which other and so on predict then if this causal sequence is correct and I physically intervene and control the variable to prevent it from changing to prevent it from responding to its natural causes how should the other variables in my causal hypothesis change? Should they become dependent or independent? And the example I used was the, the study by Claude Bernard looking at the functioning of kidneys. If you remember, there was blood entering the kidney, blood exiting the kidney, and the active or inactive state of the kidney, by which he meant whether urine was being produced in the kidney and flowing down the urethra. And he predicted, according to his hypothesis, that the functioning of the kidney was to remove waste from the blood and excrete them through the urine, and that therefore if he was to physically intervene and prevent the kidney from excreting urine, that the color of the blood wouldn't change entering and exiting uh, the kidney, and if he didn't, if he allowed the kidney to function normally, then the color would change because the kidney would then be active. So what we're going to try and do today is understand how we can replace the notion of physically controlling a variable with the notion of statistically controlling a variable. And in the first lecture I warned you that physical controls and statistical controls are not the same thing. Sometimes they give the same predictions and sometimes they don't give the same predictions. And so we can't replace physical control with statistical control unless we can understand how they're the same and how they're different and how to accurately translate between these notions. So that's the topic of our lecture today. It's going to be a rather longer lecture and in some ways a more difficult lecture because we're going to be referring to a number of concepts that you probably aren't familiar with. And so the best way to approach this lecture is to pause whenever you're not sure about something, go back and make sure you're understanding what I'm saying before proceeding to the next slide. So when I talk about translating between languages, I see this as an analogy between translating of different human languages. So in different human languages, although the words are different and the grammar is different in each language, we can usually translate rather unambiguously between different languages and express the same ideas, the same notions, 
The reason being is that these different human languages all possess words and grammatical structures which refer to these basic notions. So for instance, on the screen you see the same information being expressed in three different languages, English, French, and Dutch. And although the words are different in these three languages and the grammar is different, we can express the same notion without ambiguity in each language. So in English, I might say an increase in temperature will cause the thermometer to rise. In French, I would say une augmentation de la température fera monter le thermomètre. And in Dutch, you would say this third sentence, which I'm not going to pronounce because I don't speak Dutch. The point being that each of these languages have different words for the same concept and different grammatical structures to link these concepts together. But because all of these languages contain these concepts, we can translate between them once we know how, to, how w the words in one language map onto the words of another and how the grammatical structure of one language maps onto the grammatical structure of the other. But imagine a situation in which we have a group of people who've lived on an island separated from everyone else for many thousands of years and they've developed their own language on this island and all of the people on this island are colorblind. And imagine how difficult it might, would be to try and express notions of red tomatoes or green leaves in this language when people in this language don't understand these concepts and don't have concepts like this built into their language. So on the screen you see on the top left a photo as most people would see it with a red tomato and a green leaf and so on. And the other photos represent how people with different degrees of color blindness would see the same scene. So imagine all the people on this island see the world as in the lower uh, right corner and you try to express to them whether you, this tomato is green or red. And you would not have words for green or red in this language and so you wouldn't be able to express this concept. And this is rather similar to what happens when we're trying to translate between the language of causality which we use as scientists and the language of probability theory, which we use to analyze data. Probability theory doesn't have concepts of cause and effect, of, of, of causes preceding effects and being translated between variables. These concepts don't exist in probability theory, and so we need a way of translating without, without mistakes and without ambiguity between these languages. And that's the topic of this second language. And as you'll see, the way we're going to do this is to actually do two sets of translations. First, we translate between the language of science, of human languages, into a mathematical language of graph theory. And then we translate from this mathematical language of graph theory into the mathematical language of probability distributions and probability theory. So when I talk about the challenges and dangers of translation, what I'm referring to is the fact that in probability theory, there is no way of differentiating between saying that A causes B, B causes A, or A and B are associated or dependent on one another. In probability theory, these three situations are equivalent because there's no way of differentiating between A causes B and B causes A. Probability theory uses concepts like dependence and independence or association, conditional distributions and so on. And so we need a way of differentiating between these concepts when we use probability theory. So the person who developed the mathematical infrastructure for doing this is Judea Pearl, who you see on the screen. The first reference, the book Causality, Models, Reasoning, and Inference, provides all of the mathematical details of this theory. It's not an easy book to read, and so it's not a book that I would recommend that you read if you don't have the requisite mathematical background, although 
I hope that once you finish this course you'll have enough of an understanding that you can follow the book. The second reference, The Book of Why, The New Science of Cause and Effect, is a more popularized version of his ideas, uh, which obviously leaves out a lot of the mathematical details, but gives a more popular and understandable uh, explanation of how this theory works. And it's a very nice book to read, so I recommend that you buy it. Now, Judea Pearl's method of going between causation and probability theory involves a two-step translation. So you start with the language of science, in which we have concepts of cause and effect, of direct and indirect causes, of causal independence, and so on. And he first translates these concepts into the language of graph theory. So graph theory, as I said, is a branch of mathematics that st studies the topological links between objects, the way objects are linked in a network. And in particular, one type of graph is called a directed acyclic graph, or a DAG. And a directed acyclic graph requires that the links between the variables have a particular direction. They can only go in one way. And this allows you to link the notion of cause and effect with this directed acyclic graph. So directed acyclic graphs have analogous concepts to those found in the language of science. So cause and effect are equivalent to in a, a DAG, a parent and child. Paths between variables are equivalent to indirect causes between variables. Ancestors are causes of any type, direct or indirect. Descendants are effects of a variable, either directly or indirectly, and so on. So it's relatively easy to translate between the language of science and a directed acyclic graph. Now the important contribution of Judea Pearl was to show that given this language of graph theory, if data were generated according to a particular directed acyclic graph, then that generates a particular probability distribution. And you, this involves the probability theory. So probability theory uses concepts like dependence and independence, conditional distributions and marginal distributions. And it's possible to directly link data generated by a DAG to concepts of dependence and independence and so on in probability theory. And you do this using a mathematical operation on the DAG that's called deseparation, which is short for separation between variables in a directed acyclic graph or directed separation. So we start with the language of science, we convert our hypothesis into a directed acyclic graph, and then we use deseparation to predict how statistical conditioning on variables that have been generated by that DAG will either result in dependence or independence, conditional independence and conditional dependence, and so on. And in this way then we can link the idea of physical control of a cause in a causal system, which is a DAG, and statistical control in a probability distribution, which is the language of statistics. So let me give you an example of translating between the language of causality and a directed acyclic graph. So I'm going to explain a, an ecological system that's been studied for about 20 years by some colleagues of mine. I'm going to explain the ecology and how they understand the causal relationships between the variables. And then I'll show you how you translate that into a directed acyclic graph. So this system involves three species, arctic fox, snow geese, and lemmings. Now in this arctic system, the year-to-year -year variation in climate is determined by the annual arctic oscillation, which is a, a pattern of high and low pressure in the high arctic, which affects uh, temperature and precipitation regimes and that change from, from year to year.
the winter and the spring parts of this Arctic Oscillation primarily affect the abundance of the lemmings. The summer part of this annual cycle affects plant growth through changes in the temperature and the precipitation regimes. Now the Arctic fox prey on both the lemmings and on the eggs and the nestlings of the snow geese but Arctic fox prefer to eat the lemmings so they only switch to the eggs of the snow geese when there aren't enough lemmings to eat. So the lemming consumption rate by the Arctic fox is determined by the abundance of the lemmings. The consumption rate of the eggs by the Arctic fox is determined by the abundance of the lemmings so that when there's high lots of lemmings uh, there's relatively few snow geese eggs eaten and when there are few lemmings there are more snow geese eggs eaten. The fledgling success of the goose population is determined both by the amount of plants that are produced each year both because the plants are food for the Arctic uh, by the snow geese and because tall vegetation allows them more shelter and reduces the chances that the Arctic fox will find them. The breeding success of the foxes from year to year are determined both by the amount of lemmings they consume and by the amount of eggs that they consume. So this is the sort of causal story that an ecologist might describe and how would we go about then translating that into a directed acyclic graph. Well this is an acyclic graph which represents how these people understand the causal links between the variables in their system. So each name here is a variable and in the language of graph theory it's also called a node and the links between the variables represent the edges of this graph in particular this is a directed acyclic graph, so each ed edge has a direction represented by an arrow and that describes how information can flow from one variable to the other. So the information can only flow in the direction of the arrows. And so if you look at this DAG, you will see that it is more or less a graphical representation of what I've been just describing to you in terms of how the ecologists understand this system. For instance, I said that an increase in the abundance of lemmings increases the rate of consumption of the lemmings by the Arctic fox, and so that's represented by the arrow from lemming abundance to lemming consumption rate. And this arrow means then that if you increase or decrease lemming abundance, and you keep constant every other variable in the graph except for lemming consumption rate, then lemming consumption rate will increase when you increase lemming abundance, but the converse isn't true. The next arrow shown here is the translation of the statement that I said, which then increases the number of fox pups that are successfully raised the following spring. So increasing lemming abundance increases the lemming consumption rate which then increases the fox breeding success. So I think you'll agree to me that there's not much difficulty in understanding how you go from an ecological hypothesis in terms of human language and how you translate this into this directed acyclic graph you simply have to remember that each edge, each arrow in this graph is not describing a statistical association. It's describing a hypothetical controlled manipulation in which the variable at the base of the arrow is increased and all other variables in the graph are held constant and it describes how the variables at the head of the of the arrow will respond.
So let's look at another example of expressing causal hypotheses using DAGs. So on the left you see a causal hypothesis that you would express in a human language. So for instance I could say that I believe that variables A, E sub B and E sub C are causally independent of each other. In other words, changes in one won't affect the behavior of the other. A and E each directly cause changes in variable B, meaning if I change A or E sub B, either of those changes would provoke a change in variable B, and directly meaning that this effect is not mediated by any other variable. Variables B and E sub C are also causally independent of each other, and each directly causes changes in variable C. So if we wanted to translate that into a DAG, we would draw this figure here. So you see that A has an arrow going to B, so A directly causes B. There's an arrow from E sub B to B, meaning that changes in E sub B will also change B. There's no arrow linking A and E sub B, and in fact, it's, you cannot go from A to E sub B while following the directions of the arrows, the, path, the flow of information, and that's why A and E sub B are causally independent of each other. A is also a cause of C, but it's an indirect cause that's mediated by the variable B. So if you increase A and you don't hold constant B, then the effect of A would be transferred to the variable B, and this changed value of variable B would then be transferred on to variable C. Now, it's important to realize what this mathematical statement x arrow y doesn't mean. It doesn't mean that x is correlated with y, or that x and y are associated. It, it refers to a hypothetical controlled experiment. It means a change in x will provoke a change in y, even when all other variables in the DAG are prevented from changing if they're controlled, but a change in Y won't provoke a change in X. So these arrows then represent hypothetical uh, controlled experiments that you're doing in which you're changing X, you're holding constant everything else, and then you're seeing whether Y responds or not. So this, this translation between the human language of cause and effect and the DAG uh, is quite direct and it's quite intuitive as long as you understand that the arrows don't mean uh, correlations or associations, they mean hypothetical uh, causal manipulations. So now we're going to go on and look in more detail about DAGs and their structure. And in order to understand these, uh, these ideas, you need to master some certain words and uh, definitions. So I'm going to go over some of these now. So first of all, a DAG consists of nodes or sometimes vertices. It means the same thing. And in the context of, th of uh, this course, it's synonymous with the word variable. So the variables that we, that we use represent are represented by the nodes or vertices. So in the graph you see uh, on the screen there are five nodes or vertices or five variables A, B, C, E sub B and E sub C. Now later on in the course we're going to differentiate between observed and latent variables. A latent variable is a variable that's in your graph that's part of your causal explanation but for which you haven't been able to obtain direct observations. The next term are edges. So an edge in a graph is the line or the link between the variables or the nodes. 
and in general there can be undirected edges which are which means lines directed edges which are arrows there can be bi-directed arrows and there can be mixtures but for a, a directed acyclic graph for a DAG there are only directed edges that is arrows so you can't have anything except for an arrow in a directed acyclic graph and the, the reason is because these arrows represent hypothetical uh, manipulations, causal manipulations and so the only things that we're interested in are arrows. So if all of the edges in a graph are directed then it's called a directed graph. The next term to learn is the the, the term a directed path. So a directed path consists of moving along the graph from variable to variable or from node to node while following the directions of the arrows. So for instance we can start at A, we can move to B and then we can move to C following the directions of the arrows and that means there's a directed path from A to C. We can't go from A to E sub B while following the arrows following the directions of the arrows and therefore there is no directed path from A to E sub B. An undirected path in the context of a DAG simply means ignoring the directions of the arrows. So if we ignore the directions of the arrows then we can go from A to B and then from B to E sub C. But if we, so that's an undirected path but we can't go from A to E while following the directions of the arrows. So there is a there is no directed path from A to E sub B, but there is an undirected path between the two. Now if all of the directed paths um, prevent you from looping back and arriving at the initial variable, then it's called in a cyclic path. All of the paths in a DAG are acyclic, which means there can be no feedback loops. You can't start at, an, at a node or a variable and following the directions of the arrows loop back and arrive back at the same variable. Now I know that in ecology uh, feedback loops are important and we'll talk later about how you would how you treat these but the idea of a DAG is that there cannot be any feedback loops and the reason is because if you're thinking of a causal process, a causal process unfolds in time. And so you looping back would mean, mean going back in time and you can't do that. So we'll talk more about how to, tr how to model feedback loops in a later lecture. So if all of the paths are directed paths and none of them are cyclic, they're all acyclic, then the graph is called a directed acyclic graph or a DAG for short. Okay, so in this course we're only going to deal with DAGs, directed acyclic graphs. There's a few more terms we need to learn. First of all I want to distinguish between parents and children. So DAGs use the terminology of genealogy of parents, children, ancestors, descendants, and so on. So a parent is a direct cause of a variable. So A is the parent of B because it is a cause of B and there are no intervening variables between the two. And B is the child of A. So B is the effect of A and the child then is the direct effect that's not mediated by any other variable. An ancestor of a variable is simply any variable from which you can travel from it into the variable in question. So all ancestors are causes, but some ancestors are indirect causes and, and some, the parents, are direct causes. And similarly, we can talk about descendants. So 
all of the descendants of a variable are effects of that variable. If the effect is indirect, then it is a descendant, and if it's direct, it's a child. Okay, so if you just think about the relationships in genealogy, then you can understand the relationships in the DAG. There are a few more terms that we will discuss later on, but these are the principal ones. So, nodes, edges, directed edges, and undirected edges. If all of the edges are directed, and none of the ed and none of the paths can loop back into themselves, then it's a directed acyclic graph. So, just a few rules that you have to be aware of when you're translating between the language of causality and the language of DAGs. If, if in your causal hypothesis you believe that A is a direct cause of B, in other words, changing A will change the value of B, and that this is not mediated by any other variable in your model, then in the language of DAGs, you would say there is a directed path from A to B that does not involve any other variables in the DAG. If in your causal hypothesis you're saying that A is an indirect cause of C, in other words, changing A will cause C, but only if some other variable, intervening variable, responds between the two variables. And so in the language of DAGs, you would say there is at least one directed path from A to C that involves variables, other variables in the DAG. Finally, if you say that A is causally independent of another variable, in this case E sub B, then in the language of DAGs this would be equivalent to saying there are no directed paths in the DAG from any variable uh, A going to the variable E sub B, or more generally, from any variable X that pass, th pass through it. Okay, so there can be no directed path from A to E sub B. So here is another DAG that you see on the screen, and I'm going to ask you a series of questions, and you can test yourself to see whether you understand these notions or not. So, according to this DAG, is A a direct cause of C? If you're not sure, you can go back to another slide to review these definitions again. But the question I'm posing to you is, is A a direct cause of C given this DAG or this causal hypothesis? So the answer is no, A is not a direct cause of C. A is a cause of C, but it's indirect because it's mediated by the variable B. So if we were to hold constant B and we were to change A, then C would not respond. So A is not a direct cause of C. Is B a parent of C? Or sometimes we would say, is A a causal parent of C? Well, yes, A is a causal parent of C, because according to this graph, if you were to in ch or change the value of B and hold constant every other variable in the uh, in the DAG except for C, then C would still respond. So the effect of B is transferred to C and this transfer is not dependent on the behavior of any other variable. So B is a parent of C. Is A an indirect cause of C? Well, we discussed that earlier. The answer is yes. A is an indirect cause of C because if you change A and you don't hold constant other variables in the graph, then increasing A would increase B and then the increased B would be transferred to C. 
So C would respond when you manipulate A as long as you're not holding constant B. So it's an indirect cause, but it's not a direct cause. Is A a causal ancestor of C? Well, the answer is yes, because A is a cause of C, although it's indirect, and therefore it's an ancestor. In other words, changing A will change C as long as you're not holding constant other variables. Is E an indirect effect of B? Well, the answer is yes, it is. In fact, it's an indirect effect of B along two different directed paths. There's a path from B to C and from C to E. So if you increase B and you hold constant everything except for C and E, then increasing B would increase C and increasing C would increase E. And there's a second indirect, there's a second indirect effect, which is the path from B to D to E. So again, if you were to hold constant A and C, and then change B, but don't hold constant D, then increasing B would change D, and then the change D would then be transferred to E. So E is an indirect effect of B. Is E a causal descendant of C? Well, the answer is yes. In fact, E is not only a causal descendant of C, E is a causal child of C. So changing C would change E directly, irrespective of the behavior of any other variable in the graph. And so E is a descendant of C. Finally, well not finally, but the next question, is there a directed path from B to E? The answer is yes, in fact there are two. So there's one directed path from B to C to E, so we can go from B to E by following the arrow from B to C and from C to E. And there's a second directed path involving B, D, and E. So you can go from B to D and from D to E following the directions of the arrows. So there is, in fact, two directed paths from B to E. Is there an undirected path between B and E? Now remember, an undirected path is a path in the DAG that you can follow if you ignore the directions of the arrows. So, obviously, there are two directed paths, so there, if you ignore the directions of the arrow, you can still get from B to E. So there are, there are also two undirected paths between B and E. Is there a directed path from C to D? Well, the answer is no. If you follow the directions of the arrows, you can't go from C to D. So there's no directed path from C to D. Nor, by the way, is there a directed path from D to C for the same reason. So let's uh, pause for just a moment. Make sure you understand these terms and the answers to these questions. If you don't, go back a few slides to follow the definitions. Um, the idea is that after a few minutes of practicing things, these, these terms and these definitions will become uh, second nature to you. So, so far we've been looking at translating from the language of science, the language of cause and effect, into the mathematical language of graph theory, and more specifically, directed acyclic graphs. So the, the key point in doing this translation is that you have to imagine that you're doing a series of manipulative experiments and see what happens to some other variables. So you have to ask yourself in each case for each pair of variables, 
if I were to do a hypothetical manipulative experiment in which I were to change the value of variable x and I were to keep all other variables in the model constant except for variable y, would y respond to this change in x? If the answer is yes, according to your understanding of the causal process, then you place an arrow from x to y. If the answer is no, then you don't place an arrow from x to y. So on the screen you see the first step, uh, a verbal description of cause and effect translated into a directed acyclic graph. That's only the first step. The, the directed acyclic graph simply describes how you think the variables link up together. So you're describing the topology of your causal system. In order to go from DAGs to data, we then have to describe how we think that nature is using this causal structure, this causal topology, to generate observations that we can actually see. So let's talk a little bit now about converting your DAG into a, a series of structural equations. Now we're not going to go into a lot of detail right now about structural equations modeling. That'll be for another lecture. But I just want to explain how this step works. So on your screen you see the DAG and above each arrow I've written F sub 1A and F sub 1B and this is to remind us that we then have to describe or hypothesize how numerically we think that changes in A are converted into changes in B. So we have to describe the mathematical function linking each of our variables together. So before we go any further, I want to introduce two other terms. So in structural equations modeling, we differentiate between exogenous variables and endogenous variables. So an exogenous variable is a variable, if you like, at the outside of the model. So it's a variable which isn't being caused by any other variable in the model. Now, of course, that doesn't mean the variable is not caused by anything in nature. It just means that we don't know what it is or we're not interested in modeling that. So the exogenous variables in this simple DAG are A, E sub B, and E sub C. The other variables in the model are called endogenous variables. So you can think of these as the variables that are inside the model, or more specifically, variables which are explicitly caused by some other variable in your model. So B and C are endogenous variables because B is caused by A and E and C is caused by B and E sub C. So the next step is to convert our DAG, which describes the topology of our causal structure, into what I've called here non-parametric structural equations. And I'm showing you this simply to remind you that structural equations modeling doesn't have to assume any particular probability distribution or any particular functional relationship between the variables. It's up to you to hypothesize what these are, but there's no restrictions in principle about what these functions are or what these probability distributions might be. Now, if you use Lavan or EQS or M plus or any of the other commercial structural equations modeling, then they will impose additional statistical assumptions on your data, but those are requirements for those particular programs. They're not requirements for structural equations modeling. So for instance, when we get to Levan, you'll see that the probability distributions for the exogenous variables, A, E sub B, and E sub C, are assumed to be random variables drawn from a normal distribution. So I've written here that A 
is distributed as the tilde sign. A is distributed as a normally distribute a normal a normal random variable with a particular mean and a particular standard deviation. And E sub B and E sub C are also assumed in these in these uh, commercial programs to be normally distributed variables. Now this assumption of normality is an assumption that these models make because they work with covariance matrices so we'll we'll see that in another lecture but that's not a requirement of structural equations it's only a requirement of these programs and then we have to specify the function linking each of the causal parents and their children so how does a change in a translate into a change of b and in these uh, uh, commercial programs by by assumption the relationships are linear so we have a linear equation linking B with A and E sub B and a linear relationship linking C with B and E sub C so at this stage then we've translated from the language of science into a DAG and now we're translating from a DAG into a data generating mechanism. So it's of course a hypothesis and at this point our hypothesis not only involves how the variables are linked together but now we're hypothesizing what the probability distributions of our exogenous variables are and what the functions linking the endogenous variables to other variables. So we're assuming then that what nature is doing is that it takes for each observation i, nature first provides a value for each of the three exogenous variables and if we assume a normal distribution then we're assuming that nature is drawing these random variables from a normal distribution but if we assume a Poisson distribution or a binomial distribution or any other distribution we're assuming that na nature is sampling these values from these particular probability distributions so first of all we're assuming that nature uh, chooses a value for A E sub B and E sub C for the first observation and it chooses these from a normal distributions in this case and then at step or time t plus one nature then combines these three exogenous variables to produce the values of b according to a linear function in this case and then at time t plus two the value for observate for variable c again from a linear function so that's generating the first observation and then we're assuming that nature is done doing this continuously so it's continuously sampling values from the exogenous variables and then combining these together to produce the values for the endogenous variables and it's doing this continuously generating observation after observation after observation now just a small point um, at number one I wrote that nature provides a value for each of the three exogenous variables but we only observe variable A and that's because as you'll see in a later lecture in this case E sub B and E sub C are called latent variables so they're variables that nature has generated but we haven't actually observed in this case and these are details that we'll look at in another lecture so how we're imagining nature functioning is that it takes generates a first observation so it chooses a value of a 1.23 it chooses a value for e sub b and e sub c combines those to produce a value for b which is 3.32 and then it takes the value of 3.32 from b combines it with a value for e sub c e sub c 
produce a value of 4.46 and then it generates the next observation and the next observation and so on. So that's how we're imagining nature generating the observations that we can actually see. So of course we're assuming that nature is doing this continuously every moment of every day of every year continuously over time and so it's generating what we call a statistical population of observations and in, in fact an infinite number of these values that are continuously being generated and this implies therefore that A, B and C together form a trivariate probability distribution which has a particular form. Now, when we actually sample from nature, we're not seeing all of these infinite number of values for, for A, B, and C, for infinite number of observations. We're, of course, randomly sampling some subset of observations. So if, we random, if each of these observations represents an individual species or an individual plant, uh, and we randomly sample 100 individuals or 100 plants, then we've randomly sampled 100 lines from this infinite data set. Now, the point is that when nature is generating these values, it's almost always hidden. The, the, the process of generating these observations are almost always hidden we don't actually see the process of A being chosen, combining that with B, and then combining that with C, and so on. All that we see is the final result, which is the, the trivariate observation of values A, B, C for individual one and for individual two, and so on. So we don't actually know what the probability distribution that nature has generated. What we can see is a, a hypo, uh, is a probability distribution that we think nature has generated. So m perhaps nature has generated our three observations A, B, C given the DAG on the left, but we think that nature has done this using the DAG on the on the right, and in this case obviously our hypothesized DAG is wrong. So the next step is we want to be able to compare the probability distribution that this DAG has generated, according to our hypothesis, with the actual probability distribution that nature has generated and compare the two. And if our DAG is correct, then the probability distribution that, that we see or that we hypothesize will be the same as the probability distribution that nature has actually generated except, of course, for random sampling variation. So that's how we imagine uh, nature generating the data. So in the last slide, we said that we want to be able to compare the probability distribution that we have hypothesized, that is, the distribution that was hypothesized via our DAG and the resulting structural equations, we want to compare that to the actual probability distribution that nature has generated. But how do we go about doing that? Well, the link between the two is done by deseparation. Okay. So deseparation, again, is a mathematical operation that allows us to go do this translation between the language of graph theory, of DAGs, and the language of probability distributions. So we, a DAG, then, is a graphical description of a causal process, and this causal process possesses particular properties that are associated with the notion of causality. So has notions of cause and effect, of causal dependence and causal independence, of causal conditional dependence and independence. That is, if we, draw, if we hold constant certain variables physically, how does that change uh, the dependence or the independence of the other variables, and so on.
this process, this data generating process, generates a multivariate probability distribution and therefore pr generates multivariate observations of our data. But a multivariate probability distribution doesn't have the properties that the DAG has. It doesn't have properties of cause and effect, of causal dependence, and so on. It has different properties. It has properties of statistical dependence and statistical conditional independence, and so on. And the, the link between the two is provided by this operation called deseparation, which again is short for directed separation. So deseparation answers the following question. If the data are causally generated as given in a DAG, our hypothesis, and then I statistically rather than physically control or condition on a set of variables in the, in the DAG, set of variables that I'm calling Z, and then observe variables X and Y, will X and Y be statistically dependent or independent? So deseparation asks the question, if the data were generated according to a particular causal structure, what are the resulting patterns of statistical dependence and independence that we'll see? And of course, this was the key translation device that we needed in order to uh, use the notion of statistical control instead of uh, physical control. So deseparation is a mathematical operation on a DAG that translates between the concepts of causal dependence and independence into the concepts of statistical dependence and independence. So I'm going to give you a series of statements that are properties of DAGs. So first of all, if two variables, x and y, are deseparated by some other set of variables in the DAG, I'm calling this other set of conditioning variables Z, then X and Y will be statistically independent in the data generated by the DAG. So if two variables are deseparated in the DAG, then they will be statistically independent in the data that are generated by the DAG and therefore in the multivariate probability distribution that's generated by the DAG. Deseparation in a DAG implies statistical independence in the data generated by the causal process represented by the DAG. So deseparation is a mathematical relationship between DAGs, that is graph theory, and probability theory. And it's a logical statement, a provably logical statement of the type if-then. So if x and y are deseparated given z in a certain DAG, then x and y will be statistically independent conditional on z. This is true irrespective of the probability distribution of the variables or of the functional forms linking them. And this last statement is really important because it means that deseparation is not it doesn't assume any particular probability distribution it doesn't assume any particular functional relationships between the variables it's true always if the data are generated by a DAG then deseparation tells us whether the variables will be statistically dependent or independent upon conditioning so deseparation, in other words, is the translation device we've been looking for, the translation device between the language of DAGs and the language of probability distributions. So this then is the strategy of translation that Judea Pearl proposed. You start with a causal hypothesis as described in science. You translate that into a mathematical language of graph theory in, in particular directed acyclic graphs 
and then you use this mathematical operation of deseparation to tell us how patterns of dependence and independence in the data, that is in the probability distribution, will occur if we were to statistically control rather than physically control variables in our DAG. In other words, deseparation allows us to replace physical control in a controlled experiment with statistical control. Deseparation in a day implies statistical independence in the data generated by the causal process represented by the DAG, and this allows us to replace physical controls with statistical controls. So I'm going to present you again with the logic of the controlled experiment that we looked at in the first lecture and see how we have to modify it in order to replace physical control with statistical control. So you notice the steps 1 to 6 are exactly the same steps as we used before. And all that we have to do once we know how to use the, the mathematical operation of deseparation is that, first of all, uh, we use statistical control rather than physical control in step 3. So we predict the patterns of association how the patterns of association will change as we statistically rather than physically control that is statistically fix or statistically hold constant different variables in the DAG. Step four we conduct the experiment by statistically controlling these variables rather than physically controlling them. In step five we measure the associations between the variables in the different statistically fixed conditions rather than the, the different experimentally fixed conditions and compare the predictions of independence and independence of variables that we've predicted with the actual patterns of dependence and independence after statistically controlling uh, in our data. So as you see the logic of the controlled experiment is reproduced exactly and the logic is the same the, the advantages and the disadvantages of using a controlled experiment are the same as those when we're doing path analysis and structural equations modeling using deseparation. So I'm going to use the next few slides to explain to you what deseparation is. Now, I've already explained to you that a DAG, a directed acyclic graph, is a mathematical object that exists in graph theory, and deseparation is a mathematical operation that you do on this graph. In other words, uh, it allows you to predict how statistical conditioning on one or more variables changes the status of other variables in terms of being de dependent or independent of each other. I'm going to give you a few definitions and I'm going to use the DAG that you see on the screen. This DAG is a slight modification of the figure that's on page 25 of the book and you should replace the figure on page 25 with the figure with the DAG that you see here. Uh, there was an error in during the production of the book and this is the correct DAG that you should be using. So let's go through a, a few definitions. First of all, when I talk about a directed path from one variable to another, I'm talking about moving in the graph from variable to variable while respecting the directions of the arrows. So for instance, in the DAG you see there is a directed path from x to s sub 1. I start at x, I then follow the directions of the paths to u, and from u I follow the direction of the arrow to s sub 1. So there is a directed path from x to s sub 1 in this DAG. That's a directed path. We're also going to talk about something called an undirected path. 
So if I talk about an undirected path between two variables, then I'm talking about moving along the graph from one variable to another while ignoring the directions of the arrows. So for instance, there is an undirected path between x and v. So notice there is no directed path from x to v because if I go from x to u, then I can't go to v because it contravenes the directions of the arrow. But if I ignore the directions of the arrow, then I can go from x to u and u to v. So there is an undirected path from x to v, but there is no directed path from x to v. Sometimes I, I may simply talk about a path between two variables rather than an undirected path, and it would mean the same thing. So a directed path from one variable to another as opposed to an undirected path between two variables. Along a path, each variable is classified as either a collider or a non-collider along that path. Now be careful, being a collider or a non-collider is not an absolute property of a variable, it's only a property of a variable along a particular path. So in our path from x uh, to u to s sub 1, u is a non-collider, and in the undirected path from x to v, u is a collider. Okay, so going from x to u to v, this is an undirected path because I'm ignoring the directions of the arrows, and u is a collider. It's a collider because there are arrows pointing into it from both directions. And in the u along the path from x to u to s sub 1, so this is a directed path, here u is a non-collider because the arrows aren't pointing into it from both directions. Okay? So a path can be a directed path or an undirected path. And along each path, the variables in that path are classified as either colliders or non-colliders, depending on whether the arrows are pointing into the, a variable from both directions or not. Now the natural state of a variable or a vertex means does it allow or blow or block the flow of statistical information? Okay, so again, the same directed uncyclic path. The natural state of a vertex along a path depends on whether it's a collider or a non-collider. The natural state of a collider is to block the flow of statistical information through it. The natural state of a non-collider is to allow the flow of statistical information through it. In other words, uh, the natural state of a vertex or a variable means uh, are the arrows pointing into it from both directions or not. We're simply following the directions of the arrows. So in the directed path from x to s sub 1, there is not an arrow pointing into u from both directions along this path. Therefore, the natural state of this non-collider is to allow statistical information to flow from x into u and then from u on into s sub 1. In the undirected path x u v, u here is a collider because there are arrows pointing into u from both directions and the natural state of a, no of a collider is to prevent the flow of information passing through it. So inf statistical information passes from x to u but then it can't go on to V because it's blocked here at this collider vertex. So that's the natural state of a vertex or a variable. Statistical conditioning on a vertex switches its natural state. So a collider is naturally blocking the flow of information and if you st statistically control on it, it switches it and allows the flow of information to pass through it. A non-collider naturally allows the flow of statistical information through it, 
and if you condition on a ver on a non collider you switch its state and you prevent statistical information from flowing through it so before we go on any further i want to give you a quick test to make sure you've mastered the definition so far if you have trouble with the questions i'm going to give you then go back a few slides and go over them so that you feel comfortable with these definitions. So here's the first question. Is there a directed path from V to S sub 2? Is there a directed path from V to S sub 2 in the DAG that you see before you? Well the answer is yes. If I start at V I can follow the directions of the arrow to W and then from W I can follow the direction of the arrow to S sub 2. So there is a path from V to S sub 2. Second question. Is there an undirected path from V to S sub 2? Well, the answer is yes. If I start at V and I ignore the directions of the arrows, I can go from V to S to W, and then I can go from W to S sub 2 if I ignore the directions of the arrows. And so this path, V, W, S sub 2, is both a directed path and an undirected path. Every directed path is also an undirected path, but the opposite isn't true. There are undirected paths that are not directed paths. Third question. Is W a collider or a non-collider along the undirected path between V and S sub 2? So in the path, the undirected path that we just talked about is the variable or the vertex W collider or a non-collider? Well, the answer is that W is a non-collider, so V, W, S sub 2. There's an arrow going into W from this direction, but the arrow is not pointing into W from the other direction, so W is a non-collider along this undirected path between V and S sub 2. Is there a directed path from U to Y? The answer is no. If we go from U and try to go to Y, we can't do it because first of all, this arrow is pointing in the wrong direction and this arrow is also pointing in the wrong direction. And similarly, if we try and start at Y, we can't go this way because this arrow is pointing in the wrong direction. So there is no undirected path from U to Y. So this is an example in which there is an undirected path, but it's not a directed path. Is W a collider or a non-collider along the undirected path between U and Y? So in the, if we look at an undirected path between U and Y, there is one. I can go from U, ignoring the direction of the arrow, I can go to V, to W, and to Y. So there's an undirected path between U and Y, although it's not a directed path. And along this undirected path, W here is a collider because there's an arrow pointing into it from both directions. Okay, so... If you've answered all these, correct, these questions correctly, then you've mastered these definitions. If you had trouble with any of these questions, go back a few slides, go over them until you feel comfortable. So let's review so far. The direction of the arrow indicates the direction by which statistical information flows between variables. So in this DAG, there's an arrow from X to U, so statistical information is flowing 
from X to you. Each variable or each vertex in this DAG has a natural state along a particular path. And remember, the state of a vertex depends on what path you're talking about. So if a variable is a collider along a path, then this blocks the flow of statistical information through it. In other words, if we haven't done any manipulation on the, on the, on the DAG and you see a collider vertex, along an undirected path, that means that the natural state of this vertex or this variable is to block the flow of statistical information through it. And the natural state of a non-collider is to allow the flow of statistical information through it. So again, when I talk about the natural state, I mean the state of a variable if we haven't manipulated the, the graph. That is, if we haven't tried to hold constant or fix any variables along this uh, along the paths in that in this graph so far i've explained the notions of a directed and an undirected path in a dag and i've explained that each variable along a path is either a collider or a non-collider variable the natural state of a non-collider variable is to allow statistical information to pass through it and the effect of statistically conditioning or holding constant or fixing a variable along that path is to block the flow of statistical information along it. I also explained that the natural state of a con collider variable is to block the flow of statistical information along the path and the effect of conditioning on a collider variable opens up that variable and allows statistical information to pass through it. The last complication I want to give you is that the same thing happens if you condition on the descendant of a collider variable. Conditioning on the descendant of a collider variable has the effect of opening up the collider variable and allowing statistical information to pass through it along the path. Let me give you an, an analogy. Imagine that a DAG is like a series of pipes and valves. The valves are the variables and the arrows are the pipes with water flowing in the direction of those pipes. So naturally statistical information flows through the pipes in the directions of the arrows. The valves or if you like the variables, the vertices, the nodes, these all mean the same thing, have a natural state and conditioning on that valve, on that variable, changes its state. So if the natural state is on, the valve is naturally open and water flows through the pipe. And if the valve is naturally off, then the water is prevented from flowing through it. And the effect of statistical conditioning is to flip the state of that switch. So a, a variable or a valve that's naturally on, when you condition on it, you close it. And if it's naturally closed and you condition on it, it opens it up. So this is the formal definition of deseparation. I'm going to go through it, read it, and explain it. But I have to tell you that it's easier to understand deseparation through a series of examples rather than trying to memorize the definition. So after I've given this definition, we'll go on to apply it. And you'll see that uh, with a little bit of practice, five or 10 minutes, you'll be able to pretty much look at a, a, at a DAG and see which variables are deseparated, conditional, which other variables quite easily. So first of all, this is the notation that's used to describe deseparation, that is to make a deseparation claim in a DAG, and it says alpha or vertex alpha is deseparated from vertex beta given or conditional on a set of other variables or vertices in that DAG. So this is the notation that we're going to be using when we're going to start making
deseparation claims from a DAG. So here's the definition as given by Judea Pearl. Given a DAG G, an undirected path P between any two vertices, alpha and beta, in the DAG G is deseparated or blocked by a set of other vertices Z, which can be the empty set, if and only if the following two conditions apply. One, the undirected path P contains a chain or a fork such that the middle vertex M is in the set Z, so here M is a non-collider, or two, P contains a collider vertex M such that the middle vertex M is not in the set Z, and such that no descendant of M is in the set Z of conditioning variables. The two vertices alpha and beta are deseparated or blocked, conditional on or given the set Z if every undirected path between them is deseparated. So let's go through the steps and give an example. So we're going to use the same DAG as before and I'm going to ask the question is alpha deseparated from beta given or conditional on another set of variables Z. Okay so this is the deseparation claim is alpha deseparated from beta given or conditional on a set Z of other variables and this is also called the conditioning set. So, the first step is to write down all of the undirected paths between alpha and beta. The second step, for each of these undirected paths, you look if this undirected path contains a non-collider in the conditioning set. So, you look at the path and you see, identify each of the non-collider vertices along that path and see if any of them are in this set here, which is the conditioning set. Okay. If a non-collider is in this set, then the path is blocked. If no non-collider is in this set Z, then at this point the path is still open. Why? Remember that conditioning on a non-collider changes it from being open to closed and so if you condition on a non-collider along that path you stop the flow of statistical information passing along that path and so the path is blocked. Step 3 again for each of these undirected paths you look and see if there are any colliders along this path. Okay. If there is a collider vertex and this collider or a descendant of this collider is in the conditioning set, then that collider vertex is opened. Again, conditioning on a collider variable or the descendant of a collider variable opens up that collider and allows statistical information to pass through it. If there is at least one collider vertex that is a if there is at least one vertex along that path that is a collider and that isn't in this conditioning set and for which none of its descendants are in that conditioning set then that means that collider remains in its natural state blocked and so statistical information can't pass through it. But if that collider or if a descendant of that collider is in this conditioning set then that vertex has op been opened up. Step four, you simply look now to see if any of those undirected paths remain open. If any of them remain open, then the two variables, alpha and beta, are not deseparated. But if all of those paths have been blocked, then the two variables are deseparated. So I said that it's easier to understand deseparation by going through actual examples than trying to memorize the definition. So we're going to do this now. So here is a DAG. This is the DAG that we're talking about right here. And I'm going to ask you if X is deseparated from W 
given or conditional on a single ver uh, variable u. Okay, so the first step is to write down all of the undirected paths between x and w. Now there's only one undirected path between x and w in this DAG, but in general there could be more than one. So here is our single undirected path between x and w. Step 2. For each of these undirected paths, you look to see if it contains a non-collider in the conditioning set. If there's a non-collider in the conditioning set, then you're switching that non-collider from being on to off and blocking it. If not, then there, uh, the path is still open at this stage. So here is our undirected path here, which corresponds to this. What are the non-colliders along this undirected path? Well, there's only one non-collider, which is V. The conditioning set, however, is U. So V is not in the conditioning set. And therefore, this non-collider vertex remains open at this stage. Step 3. For each such path, each such undirected path, if there's a collider vertex along this path, and this collider or a descendant of this collider is in the conditioning set, then the collider vertex is opened. Why? Because conditioning on a collider or on the descendant of a collider opens that vertex and changes it from blocked to open. So again, our undirected path is here. There's only one collider vertex along this path, which is the variable of the vertex u. And u is in the conditioning set here. Therefore, conditioning on u opens up this path. Now V is still open because it was a non-collider and it was not, it's not in the conditioning set. So therefore, at this stage, this path is open. So there's statistical information flowing between X and W. So you do that for each of the undirected paths. And if any of those undirected paths are open, then the two vertices are not deseparated. And if all of the undirected paths have been blocked, then those two variables are deseparated. So in this case, the conclusion is that x is not deseparated from w given or conditional on u. So the answer here is that this deseparation claim is false. If we look at this undirected path here, then you can very quickly look at it and see what you have to do in order to block that path. You either have to condition on a non-collider, in this case V, or else you have to condition either on U, which is a collider, or on the, a descendant of U. So if we conditioned on either S1 and or U, then that would open up this path and if we conditioned on V, then it would block the path. So here's another deseparation claim. Okay, so now we're asking, is variable U deseparated from variable S sub 2 if we condition on the vertex V? So again, the first step is you write each of the no undirected paths between the two variables in question, u and s sub 2. In this case, there's only one, but again, in general, there can be more than one undirected path between the two variables. For each of these undirected paths, you look to see if that path contains a non-collider and if that non-collider is in the conditioning set. If it is, the path is blocked. If not, the path is still open at that stage. So in this case, our conditioning set is V. The undirected path is here. And we see that V here is a non-collider and it's in the conditioning set. So that means that blocks this path. 
and therefore statistical information can't pass between u and s sub 2 if we condition on v. Step 3, we then look for uh, the colliders along that path and if there are colliders along that path we can't condition on those colliders nor can we condition on the descendants of those colliders. In this case there are no uh, colliders along this path so nothing changes. So uh, the conclusion is that the path remains blocked because at step 2 we conditioned on a non-collider V, so which blocked the path. So again, you look at each of the undirected paths between the two variables, and if any paths remain open, then the two variables are not deseparated. And if all of the uh, undirected paths are blocked, then the two variables are deseparated. Okay, so go back a few slides if you're not comfortable yet, go through them again, and now I'm going to ask you a series of questions. I'm going to ask you a series of deseparation claims, and you're going to tell me if that claim is true or not. So here is the DAG we're going to be working with now. A causes B, B causes both C and D, and C and D together cause E. So here's the first deseparation claim I'm asking you. Is A deseparated de from variable D conditional on variable C? So try and answer the question by yourself. Pause the video and then when you've got your answer, start again. So, the first step is to write down the undirected paths between A and D. In this case, there are two. A, B, D, which is an undirected path and it's also a directed path, but there's also the path A, B, C, E, D, which is an undirected path, but not a directed path. So, we're conditioning on variable C. So the first path here, A, B, D, there are no colliders, but there is one non-collider here, but this non-collider is not in our conditioning set, which is only C. So this path remains open. What about this path? Well, in this path, there is a collider vertex E, that's not in our, our uh, conditioning set, so this path here remains closed. And in addition, this variable C is a, a non-collider, but we're conditioning on it, so we're blocking it. So this path here is blocked two in two places, here and here. So this path is blocked, but this path remains open. So that means A is not deseparated from D, if we condition on C. Here's another question. Is A D separated from D if we condition on B? So, pause the video, answer the question, and come back. So, of course, we're talking about the same two variables, A and D, so we're looking at the same two undirected paths. In this case, in this path here, B is a non-collider, but B is in the conditioning set, so that means conditioning on B blocks this variable and therefore blocks this path. What about this path? Well, B is also in this path, it's a non-collider, so conditioning on it blocks it here, so this path is blocked and it's also blocked in this case by E since E is a collider and we haven't conditioned on it. So that means this path is blocked and this path is blocked and therefore A is deseparated from D conditional on B.
Again, if we look directly at the DAG, A and D, it's easy to see here that if we condition on B, this path is blocked, and also this path is blocked, both here and here. So, here's another question. Is A D separated from E if we condition or block both A, both C and D together. So is A D separated from E if we condition on both C and D together? Again, answer the question, pause the video, and then come back to see the answer. So of course the first step is to write the undirected paths linking A and E. In this case there are two. A, B, D, E. That's an undirected path. It's also a directed path. There's also the path A, B, C, E. That's an undirected path. It's also a directed path. So here's the two undirected paths we're looking at. Here's the conditioning set. So along this path we see that D here is in our conditioning set and D is a non-collider. Therefore, this path is blocked. On this path, we see that C is a non-collider and C is in the conditioning set, so this path is also blocked. Therefore, A is deseparated from E if we condition at the same time on both C and D. Here's Another question. Is C D separated from D if we condition at the same time on both B and E? Pause the video, answer the question, and then come back. So again we have to write the two undirected paths linking C and D. In this case there is there are two. If we start at B, we can go to C and D. So C, B, D is an undirected path. And C, E, D is also an undirected path. Neither of those are directed paths, but they're both undirected paths. So here's our two undirected paths. Here in this path, we notice that B is a non-collider. And B is in the conditioning set. And therefore, conditioning on B blocks this path. On this path we see that E is a collider and E is in the conditioning set so conditioning on a collider opens this path. So this path is open, this path is closed because there's at least one path between C and D that remains open therefore C and D are not deseparated if we condition simultaneously on both uh, B and E. As an added bonus, what would happen if um, we were not to include E in our conditioning set? Well, in this case, we still have our two undirected paths. B is a non-collider, and then we're conditioning on it. And this path is naturally closed unless we condition on E or descendant of E. But if we leave E out of the conditioning set and there are no descendants of E, then this path would remain blocked. So this, in this case, C and D would be deseparated if we condition only on B. So assuming that our data were generated by this DAG, if we statistically condition on both C and D, would A and E be dependent or independent? Think about it, pause the video, and when you've got an answer, come back. So, remember that a DAG describes the data generating process by which we're assuming that nature is generating our observations. So if nature actually used this DAG to generate our observations, we know that uh, A and E 
are d-separated if we condition both on C and D and we know that d-separation implies statistical independence so that means that A and E would be independent of one another if we statistically conditioned on C and D together. If in our data we observe that both A and E are not independent after we've statistically conditioned on both C and D, then what would you conclude about our assumption that the data were generated by this DAG? Think about it, pause, and then come back. So, if you thought about it, the answer is that we have assumed that nature used this DAG to generate our data, and we know that if this assumption is correct, then A and E would be d-separated if we condition both on C and D, and since d-separation implies statistical independence, we know that A and E would have to be statistically independent if we conditioned on both C and D, if this was actually the DAG that nature used. If when we do our test, we find that that's not true, then we have to conclude that nature didn't use this DAG to generate our data. So that gives us a hint of how we can use d-separation to test causal claims without using physical control and replacing that with statistical control. So now that you've learned about d-separation and you've gone through a few examples, your next goal should be to be able to look at a DAG, at any DAG, and simply by looking at it, answer any d-separation claim uh, derived from that DAG. Now obviously when you have lots and lots of variables it becomes rather cumbersome and you'll see that in practice we're going to do all this by the by computer but it's very useful to make sure that you can understand the concept of deseparation that you can do this visually. So for instance if I were to show you the the DAG that you see here uh, and ask you is X deseparated from S2 if we condition on S1. And just looking at that DAG, you should be able to answer that question. If you can't, then there is a package called GGM that you can download from the CRAN site into R. And in this package, there are two functions that you can use in order to test your knowledge of the notions of DAGs. The first function is called DAG, capital letters, and this function allows you to enter a DAG and save it. In this case, I've called it my DAG. And you do this simply by using the syntax that you're use, useful, used to with uh, LM and other statistical packages in R. So in the DAG, U is caused by X and V, and so in this function you would write u tilde x plus v. You should read that as u is caused by x and v. And then the second variable here, s1, is called caused by u, so you would write s1 tilde u, and so on. Um, the order in which you place these various uh, uh, statements separated by commas doesn't matter. You can place them in any order you like. And once that DAG has been saved in the object my.dag, then you use a second function called dsep, which returns true or false depending on whether the deseparation claim is true or false. And so the first argument, amat, is the DAG that you've already saved. The second argument, first, is the first variable uh, that you want to know about, so in this case x. Second is the second variable you want to know about, in this case s2. And it doesn't matter the order of these, you can place s2 as x as first and x as second, it doesn't matter. And the third argument, con, is the conditioning set, and in this case the conditioning set involves only s1. And if there was more than one, you would 
enter this as a vector so you would write between quotes uh, s1 comma and then the other variables in your your conditioning set if there's more than one uh, it's important that the names you give here x s2 and s1 are exactly the same as the names that you gave to create your DAG and it returns in this case the answer false so x will x is not deseparated from S2 conditional on S1 and just looking at that DAG you should be able to understand why just go through the same steps that you've already learned so you first of all write out the undirected paths linking X and S2 and in this case there's only one here you then look for the uh, non-colliders along that path there are two x and w and neither of these two non-colliders are in the conditioning set so these two variables remain open there's one collider u along this undirected path u isn't in the conditioning set but you notice that s1 is a, a causal descendant of u and remember if you condition on a collider or on the causal descendant of a collider you open up that collider so this variable is open because you've conditioned on its causal descendant so this is open this is open this is open so this undirected path is open statistical information can flow between these two variables and so they're not deseparated So to practice on page 26 of the book, um, you'll find a series of deseparation claims based on this DAG. Remember again that the the DAG is the one that you see on the screen, not the one that was presented in the book because that figure was incorrect. So the first column then gives a series of deseparation claims and their answers, and the second gives the explanation for why that is this, the case note again there's an error in the book that you should correct here so go through these try them uh, construct your own DAG ask some deseparation claims and check whether your answers are correct or not using those two functions in the GGM library and when you feel comfortable carry on Now I'd like to talk about some counterintuitive consequences of deseparation and I'm not going to talk so much about the limitations uh, in this presentation but there are some described in the book that you should check out as well. The first is a counterintuitive consequence of conditioning on a common child in a regression context. Um, Imagine that the data that you're analyzing in a regression is generated by this DAG. So X and Y each cause Z, and X and Y are causally independent of each other. And remember this is because there's no, there are no directed paths linking X and Y. So X and Y are causally independent. Now imagine you do a series of regressions. I'm going to show these regressions and I'm going to ask you to predict what, how you think uh, the answer will be in terms of whether the variables are significant or not in these regressions. So first of all you would do a regression of uh, Z regressed on X. And then you would do a regression of Z regressed on Y. What would come back as an answer? Well, if you did this regression, and I'm assuming here that you've generated en enough data that you don't have to worry about statistical power, uh, then the answer would be that Z is significantly related to both X and Y in each of these two simple regressions. So in the first regression, you would come back saying, yes, Z is a significant predictor of X, and in the second regression, the answer would be 
yes, Z is a significant predictor of Y. What would happen if you were to regress X or Y on X? Well, according to the DAG, they're causally independent. What would happen if you did this regression? Well, the answer would come back that Y is not significantly related to X. So you notice that so far, the answers coming back from the regression are what you would have expected uh, based on your causal understanding of this system. X is a cause of Z, and so Z is a function of X. Y is a cause of Z, and so Y is a function of X. X is not a cause of Y, and Y is not a cause of X, and there are no common causes for of both X and Y, and so uh, X and Y would be independent. What happens now if you were to regress both Y and Z on X? In other words, you would do a multiple regression, X as a function of both Y and Z. Think about it for a moment, and then I'll show you the answer. Well, the answer is that if you did this, you would the regression would tell you that both Y and Z are significantly related to X. And that's rather strange, isn't it? Because you know causally that Y is completely independent of X. And furthermore, when you did your simple regression, uh, y, uh, was, y was independent of X. And yet, when you do a multiple regression, Y becomes a significant predictor of X even though it's causally independent, and even though we know that it's independent if we just look at the two variables. This phenomenon in which when you add new variables to a multiple regression, it changes the significance of other variables is a common occurrence, and it's one that I know from experience students are often very confused with. But the answer actually is found by looking at the notion of deseparation. If you ask me, given that DAG, is X deseparated from Z if we condition on nothing? That is, if the conditioning set is empty? And the answer, if you look at this DAG, is yes, because if we look at deseparation, there is one undirected path between X and Z. There are no non colliders between the two, and there are no non colliders in the conditioning set. So the path is open. There are no colliders between X and Z, and there are no colliders uh, uh, excluded or in the, in the conditioning set. And so there is an open path from X to Z, and so they're dependent. And that's what the regression here is telling you simply. There is a statistical dependence between X and Z if you don't condition any, on anything else. And the same thing for Y and Z for exactly the same reason. Y is not deseparated from Z if we don't condition on anything. Therefore, they're dependent, and that's what the regression is telling you. Similarly, is X deseparated from Y if we don't condition on anything? Well, again, the answer is yes, they're deseparated, and so they are independent, and therefore there's no significant relationship between X and Y when we look at that regression. But in the, the last regression, what we are actually asking is, is X deseparated from Y conditional on Z? And if you look at the, the, the DAG and you use the concept of deseparation, you'll see the answer. There is one undirected path between X and Y here. There is a collider at Z. And Z is in the conditioning set because Z is part of one of the dependent variables in your regression. When you're doing a regression, the significance of the coefficients in your regression are based on a series of partial correlations. They're testing whether the effect of Y is associated with X conditional on or holding constant all the other variables in your regression model. 
and in this case you're holding constant Z and therefore this, the deseparation claim is telling you exactly what the regression is even though this seems counterintuitive to, to many students when they're learning about multiple regression. So that's the first counterintuitive consequence of deseparation. A second counterintuitive consequence is the notion of selection bias in a data set. So imagine that some private school admits students based either on their academic abilities or on their their sporting abilities. So that they have some sort of a ranking in which they look at their academic abilities and some measure of how good they are in sports and then if they're above a certain level they're admitted to the private school obviously we're assuming that these students can all pay for it and therefore all the people who are actually in the school have a ranking have a, val a ranking above some cutoff value and any, any student who didn't have that ranking above the cutoff value is not admitted to the school. So even if in the general population there is no correlation, there's no association between academic ability and sporting ability, if we were to look at the correlation between these two variables only for the students who are actually in the school, we would find that there is an association. In fact, there would be a negative association. And the reason for that is because being admitted into your data set is conditional on attaining some kind of a ranking. And that ranking is, to, is caused by your academic ability and your sporting ability. So being admitted into the school means that you're already conditioned on having a certain ranking. And therefore, the de these two variables are not deseparated conditional on being admitted into the data set. Since we're biologists, we can think of what consequences that might have in terms of any other selection process. If the only objects that we're measuring are those who have been selected and those who haven't reached the, the level that's necessary to be selected have been excluded, maybe because they've died, then you can see how these sorts of correlations could arise between variables in such situations, even if in the general po population, before the selection event has occurred, there is no association between those variables. So now we can start to uh, appreciate the subtle implications of deseparation when we're trying to uh, analyze our data. Here's another counterintuitive consequence of deseparation. I've talked earlier, I said that a DAG is a directed acyclic graph. In other words, there cannot be any feedback loops in that graph. But imagine that you want to analyze a graph like this where X causes Y, Y causes Z, and Z feeds back to cause X. Um, as I said, th these feedback loops are not allowed in a DAG, and deseparation applies only to DAGs, and therefore, in general, you cannot analyze these sorts of feedback loops uh, using deseparation uh, and the, the more general notion of path analysis on structural equations modeling. Now, in, a, in, a, in fact, we know that under certain conditions, deseparation does work in a feedback system. If all of the variables are continuous variables and all of the relationships between the variables are linear, then deseparation in a feedback loop like this still implies conditional independence. But in general, that's not the case. If any of the variables are not continuous or if any of the functional relationships linking the variables are not linear, then there can be deseparation claims uh, that are incorrectly predicting patterns of dependence and independence in the DAG. 
But in fact, this counterintuitive consequence is simply due to the fact that when we're writing DAGs with, when we're writing uh, causal explanations with feedback loops, in effect we're ignoring the time dimension. Remember, a DAG is proposing a hypothetical data generating mechanism that nature uses to generate our observations. And in nature, in uh, in reality, in all of all, all of the world, in fact, uh, dynamic processes occur in time. If you think about it, we know from the most fundamental laws of physics that nothing can go faster than the speed of light and nothing with mass can reach the speed of light. And so any causal process in nature uh, is occurring not simultaneously but over time steps. So in fact if we were to write our DAG out uh, including this time dim dimension then what would we be saying is that x at time plus 1 causes changes in the values of y at the next time step and then these new change values of y cause changes in z at the next time step and then z at time 3 generates a change in x at time x plus 4. So in other words, the values of x here are not the same as the values of x there. And so when we write this out as a, a time series, we see that this DAG is not, doesn't actually have feedback loops. Now, sometimes this will help you and sometimes it won't. Uh, if in nature the process generating the data are occurring very rapidly, uh, such that we can't actually take measurements in a time series, and the, the measurements we do take are a mixture of observations being generated at lots of different periods of time all mixed together, then we have a problem and there's no obvious solution to this, uh, except as I said, if you if your data are all of your variables are continuous and all of your relationships are linear. Uh, at other times uh, you can do this and it really depends on the, the speed with, at, with which this information is looping back upon itself. So if you're studying ecosystem processes that are occurring over a longer time span, over many years, then you can certainly uh, use this trick. If the phenomena are physiological phenomena that are occurring extremely rapidly, uh, then you you can't use this trick. So we're going to stop our lecture here. Remember we began by talking about DAGs, deseparation, deseparation and data, how to translate between these languages of causation and probability theory, and the basic strategy that I've been trying to explain to you is that you begin by stating your hypothesis using the language of cause and effect, the language that scientists use. You convert this into a DAG and you do this by imagining a series of hypothetical controlled experiments in which you say for the two variables in question, if, if I were to control every other variable in my DAG except for these two variables and impose a change on the first, would the second respond yes or no? And if the answer is yes, it will respond even if I've controlled all the other variables physically, then I add an arrow between the two, and if the answer is no, then I don't. And this then converts your causal hypothesis into a DAG. And then we use the notion of deseparation on a DAG to produce predictions of statistical dependence or independence and we're going to do that between each unique pair of variables conditioned on each possible set of other variables using the notion of deseparation. And this predicts a whole series of predictions about whether these variables are going to be dependent or independent and how these patterns of dependence and independence will change as we hold statistically hold constant different combinations of other variables using the same logic as in the controlled experiment. And once we've done that, 
we put it all together, then we'll get the notion of path analysis and structural equations modeling. And so in the next lecture, we're going to go into more detail about how you condition on variables statistically and how you put all this together to produce a statistical test that I've called a DCEP test and how you can use that to test causal hypotheses in the context of path analysis.